all right, well, what are we going to do the next morning? So we're going to eat breakfast, right? We're going to have pr practice. We have to COVID test again, three COVID tests in a row. That's super exciting. So then what are we going to do for, so we're going to have practice. And then what are we going to do for pregame? Oh, well, got to call Longhorn. Got to make sure that we got pregame for that to make sure that we're, everything's ready. And then it's going to be picked up and everything else. So I, you know, it's been, it's been a, it's been a busy week. And with that being said, welcome in to episode, I think this is 27, right, of the Mind of a Coach podcast, I believe, Nate, we made it to 27. Um, 27. 27, we got conference uh, conference tournaments going on this week, y'all are in the Division 2 NCAA tournament, y'all played this weekend, congrats on making it there. Um, and then Thank next week, we got the big dance starting up, uh, Selection Sunday coming along. Uh, Nate, I know you're pretty tired and, uh, and worn out right now, but other than that, you okay? I'm great, hey, Seth. I yeah. am tired. <clears throat> I am tired. Um, but hey, this is this is one of those this is one of those, one of those episodes. In the words of uh, JJ Butler, we, we just we gotta prosper. We gotta prosper and, and grind through this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so what's the uh, who y'all got this weekend? We have Georgia Southwestern on Saturday. If we win, we play Alabama Huntsville. If we win that, then we'll play the winner of Flagler, or we'll play either Flagler, West Georgia, or Valdosta to go to the Elite Eight. Okay, and where uh, where are those games being played? Um, we're playing in Valdosta, Georgia. In Valdosta, that's where the uh, that's where the National Tur Division Two tournament is. Yep. Cool. Yes. Cool. No. 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 Um, so they're at region sites. So the way Division Two works is like there's a certain amount of conferences that are in each region. Mm -hmm. So the best team out of those certain conferences go to the region and so that's the sweet 16 so mm -hmm. even if like let's say us in alabama huntsville or let's say us alabama huntsville west georgia and um, valdosta state were four out of the eight best teams in the country yeah well you would only get one of those four out of the sweet 16 because they're all in the same region right right so um funny enough there were some teams up north that were like four and four, four and three that made the NCAA tournament. Yeah, because nobody else was in that region. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's that's weird to me that they did it that way. But it's kind of you know. it's kind of crazy, especially this year that they still went with that path. But yeah. you know, it's um, you know, God, they they must have reasons for it. I don't know. How uh, how y'all feeling? How y'all feeling about Saturday? Um, I feel good. I feel yeah. good. I'm just. Excited to get down there and play basketball and enjoy yeah, the enjoy the whole basketball part. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you you know, you were talking a little bit pre-show. You were talking about just there's so much stuff that goes on behind the scenes in college basketball, other than just the game that nobody really you know understands until you grind through it like you've been doing. There's so much that goes on getting food. Now you got to get individual meals, things like that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's tough. And I was joking about the whole spaghetti thing, but. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. I, it, it's funny because, like, although I get tired doing it, it's like I I truly enjoy getting to do it when, like, the guys are excited about it and happy about it. Yeah. It makes everything worth it. Yeah. Now, do I get exhausted? Yeah, but it's worth it when, like, it's like, oh, wow, thanks. Like, this is awesome. So Yeah. Um, hey, okay. So, for our historical fact of the week, we did no research this week. But, Nate, we're just going to take a guess, and then next week we're going to come back and we're going to confirm our answer. But the question that I have that I have for for this week is: Do we know? We're both going to take a guess. Who won the most conference tournament championships in NCAA history? My guess is going to be Gonzaga. Who you got? Oh gosh, no research. Well, probably. Well, I, look, this is just a question. I mean, you you can guess that if you want to. That can be your guess. I'm going to go UCLA. Yeah, Conference Tournament Championships. Okay. All right. Well, hey, we'll come back next week. I mean, they won start. 11 national tournaments in a row. I assume they won their conference tournament as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. maybe Gonzaga's maybe. a good guess. Yeah, that, that's my guess. But, um, Nate, I, I, I'm empty. I'm empty this week. There's oh, nothing no. in here. Uh, I'm soulless. There's nothing, there's oh, nothing no, that I need to that. release and get off my chest. Um, so, I'm sorry for that. Next week, I got something coming, though. Um, but so for this episode, we got uh, assistant coach Steve Lepore. Um, he is now the current assistant at Eastern Kentucky. So we hope y'all uh, stay tuned and enjoy that. We're, we're in the middle of remodeling our house. So like uh, we, we haven't had a, uh, 
a sink or uh, a kitchen and probably since like right after Thanksgiving, but should be done this week. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pain. Not uh, having. We didn't have a, a washer and dryer until about probably three weeks ago. And you don't realize how much you, you miss a washer and dryer until you don't have one, man. <laughs> well, y'all, you know, y'all been doing the old school way? No, nah, we, we would like go over to AW's house and like, you know, just go for one whole day. But it was, you know, it just, I, honestly, I wear like the same stuff for like two months at work. I just, <laughs> like, I, I just have the managers wash it and just, you know, yeah. wear the, you know, wear the, you yeah. know I, I mean, I wear the same stuff almost every day anyways, but yeah. You know, mm-hmm. But no, I'm not having the kitchen sucks, man. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You still got the ping pong table, right? Is that set right. up? It's not in the basement, but the basement flooded last week. So what? Oh my goodness! Yeah. It's actually good you didn't come over that night because uh, you know, I didn't even have it set up. And oh I, yeah. We still yeah. got all the boxes down there, so like it flooded with all of our boxes down there. So oh up. my gosh. Yeah, it was like right after we played you guys, and I had to scout on Austin P on Thursday, so I'm literally like. Vacuum up the the basement while I'm watching film. All yeah. Day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's uh, terrible. Hey, we're gonna go ahead and uh, get into it real quick. We got assistant coach Steve Lapore uh, from Cleveland, Ohio. Went to St. Edwards High School in uh, in Cleveland. Uh, went on to play at Northwestern for two years. Transferred to Wake Forest, where he finished a, a stellar career there. Uh, went back to his high school as an assistant for a little bit. Uh, became the assistant at Hargrave my first year. You were there for two years, and you went on to VMI after that before joining A.W. Hamilton at Eastern Kentucky in, uh, in May of 2018, right? That's correct. Yeah, cool, so, man. Uh, appreciate you coming on, man. I, I, I was doing the math in my head. What am I, like 0-5 against y'all right uh, so far? I think y'all beat us five times since I've been coaching. Oh, uh, yeah, I think you're right because we played you guys in the uh, – we got you in the tournament. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've had some close ones, but uh, – yeah. But yeah, I mean, ever since you joined the staff, they can't seem to beat us. <laughs> <laughs> y'all, uh, y'all are joining the A Sun next year, right? Yes, yeah, we're we're making the move. We're excited about it. Um, I don't know, you know, we've been watching that conference a little bit this year. I mean, obviously, you know much more because you played in it. Um, yeah. Going, but uh, excited to you know play some new teams and excited to uh, the OVC is tough, man. So yeah, it, for sure. To, uh, play some new teams and and. Uh, Bellarmine's going to be in it. They're they're about an hour and a half from us, uh, so that'll probably be a nice little rivalry because yeah. we won't have the Moorhead thing anymore. We're going. We'll still be in uh, Nashville playing Lipscomb. So Jacksonville State's coming with us. So we got to continue to play Ray Hart. We we the last three times we played Jacksonville State, they went to overtime. Yeah, so, that they're that they're a tough that's crazy. Team. That's that's two y'all are two. I mean, that's two really good teams that are going into the uh, to the A Sun. What are y'all like? What are y'all thinking as a? What are y'all doing as a staff right now to prepare moving to a new conference? Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing we're doing right now is just recruiting. And, and you yeah. know, this, this is the time that you have your player meetings, you find out who's transferred from your team, you find mm-hmm. out who's transferred from other teams, and then you, you get into, you know, fi- you know, like f- fixing up your roster. But it, this year is so different because everybody knows because of the, the high school kids. I mean, it just – it would be tough to be a high school kid this class or even the next one where there's so many transfers and there's so many kids that uh, – you know, the kids that they get a free year that can all come back. So there's just not enough room for everybody, mm-hmm. uh, or at least you can load your roster up, but everybody you normally only get 13 scholarships. Now you can have more if your school allows it. So it's like, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of competition, but heading into the A Sun next year, I think, you know, we're, we're obviously looking at who's transferring from the, from the A Sun schools now. Um, but once we get our roster, get, get our team set, get into our workouts, then we'll start watching film on, you know, what they did last year and uh, kind of move forward from there. But, um it's it's still kind of early to really you know dig too deep into it just take care of what we got to take care of now and then we'll get to that when we have so coach um first off my name is nathan moran um thanks asa um (laughs) but um so how are you trying to sort through this transfer portal because it's it's going off more than i think it ever has like how how are you trying to sort through it right now i mean it's crazy because it's like and this week is when it, you know, when the season's in and it just, it literally is probably like 50 names a day or, or more. And, you know, we, we kind of look through it. We look at every name. Um, and then when the names pop up, us assistant coaches and other guys on our staff, we're all watching film and kind of evaluating each guy. But it, it, it's, it's hard to do. Like I said, it's hard to, you got to find out what your team, what your roster is bringing back first before you know exactly what your needs are. But then you also got to keep in mind, you know, these, some of these, I mean, a lot of the kids transferring have put up really good numbers mm-hmm. and 
it, just the way it's been, it's like, it's like selling and buying a house. Whatever the market is, is what that kid's value is going to be. And for whatever reason, transfers seem to have a little bit higher value than, than you may think just because they've already had experience. They've been in the college program. They've proven that they can do certain things. So it's like, you know, you get excited about a kid. And then, and this is like in the last couple of years, you know, you get excited about a kid in the transfer portal and you're going all in trying to get him. And then he goes like two levels higher than you. And you're like, I mean, you know, is that kid really going to, you know, and then you, you follow him throughout the year. And it's crazy how sometimes it pans out and a kid makes it and has a great career. And then, so, you know, other times dude goes from averaging 13 a game to averaging three a game and playing half the minute. So you just never, it's so hard. It's such a tricky thing to, to try to figure out. So, I mean, I don't think there's any one way to do it, but you just, it's, it's one of those things where it's totally changed recruiting. And it's, cause I was at VMI first and we couldn't get transfers. I mean, we could, but it was really hard because you had a, a military requirement. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was, it was pretty much impossible. So we really didn't even look at it. You can't get grad transfers there either. Mm -hmm. So at BMI, it's all high school. And that's kind of sure. what everybody used to be, mostly all high is school. That, is that a rule you can't get grad transfers there? They don't have like grad transfers. They don't have – okay, got you. Oh, so, you know, yeah, so, I mean, you can't, you can't bring them in. So that kind of ma – it makes your, your life easier because, you you know, you're narrowing down who you're, you're recruiting. But mm -hmm. you come here to, to Eastern Kentucky and we're getting grad transfers. We're getting JUCO kids. We wouldn't get JUCO kids at BMI either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, get, we're getting everything, tra just regular transfers, JUCO transfers, grad transfers, and – prep school and, and high school kids. So, and we have a good mix of all that. Um, so it just kind of, um, it makes the pool a little bit bigger, but every, um, every source you try to get kids from has a little different story where some JUCO kids are, are ready to go. Their bodies are ready. They've been, they've been well coached. And some of them, it's a little bit of a culture shock. Uh, same thing with, with transfers. You know, when a kid transfers, Sometimes they just need a, a fresh start, but sometimes there's a reason why they're transferring, you know, and, and, sure. and, you know, they think if they go to somewhere else that everything's just going to be better and all their problems aren't going to follow them. So, um, but some of them need to, you know, they're playing at too high of a level or, you know, it's so much better for them to get to the right level where they can just be themselves and, and kind of play their, their proper, you know, a lot of it's position. Some guys play out of position at one level and they need, you know, so every case is different. So like you kind of, you just got to do your homework and, and, you know, try to get to know the, the kid and the, just like you do any type, any, any other type of recruiting. But um, I think it's, like I said before, it's tough on high school kids because really most, most programs are looking at transfers first, mm -hmm. grad transfers second. Grad transfers are great because you only got them for a year. So, I mean, uh, even you only got them for a year, if they, if, if they play well, it's, it's great. You only get them for a year. Most of them are really, you know, they're, they're really experienced, but if they don't play well, you know, what are they, they're not, they're stuck. They're not going to go anywhere. They're done. So like the, they even have the higher value. So you're looking at those two guys and you're looking at junior college kid. I mean, it's just like the order of how most programs look at it is, you know, they want to stay, you know, you, you get old and then you stay old. You don't have to keep bringing in freshmen and dealing with freshman type stuff. So, uh, but that, it, it, everybody's philosophy is different. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to us about being a VMI. We had a Navy, a Navy assistant coach on, and then obviously we've had a couple of hard grade people on military aspects there. Talk to us about the different challenges of being at a Division One school with the military, you know, just the different hardships, things you run into, ways that you have to sell the school to a recruit. Talk to us about that a little bit, being at a place like VMI. Well, I mean, it was like uh, before we got there, the, the, the head coach that was there before we got there, he said, uh, and it was so true, he said, you know, you can do all the recruiting you want, but – you you really it's really a 50 50 chance once you get them on campus because once you get them on campus half of what you're doing you're trying to you know you're trying to show them everything that you have on campus uh, what the school can do for the kids but at the same time you're kind of like hoping that they don't see you know a group of 50 people getting screamed at doing push-ups and you know just like all the things that go on, yeah. on campus on a daily basis that is part of their, their daily life and you can't give them the whole picture because a lot of kids are like, man, I'm not doing that. You know? <laughs> but so, like, it was a tricky type of thing where it was like, you know, the, 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 at VMI, you have to live on campus all four years. There's no question about it. The seniors live on the bottom floor. The juniors live on the second floor and so on. So freshmen live on the top floor. And, you know, like where you're competing with other schools where you can live off campus, you have nice dorms, you have, you know, they're living in barracks and it like, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it, it's pretty intimidating. So everything changes, but no matter what school you're at, you got to figure out, you know, what you're selling to the kids, um, how that's going to work, what, what, you know, how that's going to work for the kid, why he would want to come there. 
And one of BMI's biggest things is like the job, once you, once you graduate from BMI, the job placement, it, like the, the starting salary when I was there was over like 55,000, like the average starting salary right out of school. And then five years later, it was like close to 100,000. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things. One of our hashtags we came up with was like BMI four for 40 saying like, come here for four years and you're, you're set for your next 40 years. So your, your, your angle is a little bit different. Um, you know, you're, you're selling toughness and you're selling like everything that we want to preach. We want you to become as a basketball player. You're getting it, you know, every day uh, with your routine through going through the military, like you did at Hargrave, you had to wake up every morning, you had to go to formation and all that's true though. I mean, you think mm -hmm. about every basketball coach that talks about discipline, getting better, making their, better, their, their players better, but how awesome is it to have like, not just your basketball coach making you do that, somebody, your, your, your academic advisor, you know, like your professors, but also like you have a whole nother set of military people that are yeah. forcing you to, to become a grown man really early. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like the parents, they're all in. All I mean, about it, yeah. The, the yeah. school's basically reiterating what you're trying to do as a coach, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, but the parents don't have to go through all the, all the stuff, but <laughs> they, they can see, you know, the benefits for, for their son. So, so it, it was just a different, um, total different approach. And I mean, even the other thing too is like there's a hell week. So the first week they get there, I mean, they shave their heads and they're marked. All, they, don't even, they can't even look at a basketball. Yeah. They're doing all this military stuff. And we would have kids leave in the first three days. I mean, you recruit them for a year, months, you know, do all the stuff. You get them to come. And then three days later, it's like, man, this is crazy. I'm not, you know, I'm getting out of here. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just a lot. There's like a lot of, you know, it's never, it's, you, you know, it's just never over until you get through all the steps. But at the same time, I mean, I thought it was an awesome start place for me to start in Division One because it is difficult to recruit there. It is difficult to win there, but it makes you a better coach. It makes you a better recruiter, um, you know, and you learn about yourself. And, 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 and it also kind of narrows things down where you're not – I mean, you have to have a certain type of academic kid. You have to have a certain type of a kid that could, has the mentality to go to that type of school. So, I mean, you can automatically scratch off a, a bunch of kids because you're like, you know, once you make your calls and get to know the people around, you're like, yeah, he's probably not the military type. So you don't waste your time. You just move on to the next one. You know, so mm -hmm. so it, it has its, its positive and negative, just like any school, but it, it's definitely a challenge. And then, like we just said, the, the next challenge is the transfer portal. I mean, they just had three guys transfer this year. Their, their leading scorer, uh, their leading rebounder, and then a third guy uh, that transferred within this week. And it almost happens, like, every year. So, yeah. I mean, that's just part of the deal. That's tough. So. Uh, let's pivot a little bit. Talk to, what year was that USA basketball stuff you did, that team you were with? Uh, I did it two years. So it was like 90, it was like 98, 99 was my, my, uh, going into my freshman year mm -hmm. in college. And then the next, so that was the qualifier where like North America played South America and like top two or three teams qualified. And then the next summer, which was, you know, go, the summer going into my sophomore year in college, we played in the championship, uh, and got a, we ended up losing in the championship game. We got a gold, uh, silver medal. You uh and you you won the most out didn't you get like most outstanding player or MVP or something of that and well, I was the leading scorer um, yeah I was the leading scorer but really it was like there was eight guys that play had NBA careers on that team mm -hmm. and I, all I did was like shoot open threes yeah yeah I, I, <laughs> hey you know I wanted, right I wanted, yeah so talk, I mean talk to us about that team who you played with uh and kind of how that experience helped you out going into college uh and just you know what it taught you. Well, it was awesome because I, I, I wasn't really high ranked. Even on my high school team, I was the third option. Our, our point guard played at Cincinnati. Steve. Yeah, y'all had some y'all had some talent at the same time. Uh, we yeah, it was a Catholic school. We were loaded. Uh, but mm -hmm. we all had played together in AAU since we were like 12 years old. So our point guard ended up going to Cincinnati. He got he was on the Naismith Award, uh, you know, like top five players by the time he was a senior in college. Our center, Sam Clancy, played at uh, USC. He's still playing pro now. He, he got drafted. He really? Played in the NBA for a year or two, and then he's been playing overseas. Still playing. He's 42, 41 years old. So <laughs> I was the third option on the team. So I couldn't believe I got, like, a, I got the tryout to this USA team. And I was going to Northwestern, and my, my coach was a Nike guy, Kevin O'Neill. And he, he somehow – it was, like, USA basketball is all Nike coaches. Like, and, and so he got me the tryout. And I remember, like – I mean, I was, like – you know, the season was over. I was running sprints. I was doing all kinds of things because I, I, like, really wanted to make this team. And I guarantee, like, the other guys weren't because when I got there, I was just in better – literally, I was in better shape than everybody. 
All I did was run in transition and made a bunch of threes. Because at that level, everybody's really good, and you don't have to – you just got to be really good at one thing. But we had, like um, – I mean, there weren't huge names in the NBA, but, like, Quentin Richardson was on the team. The, the, the first year of the starting lineup was Keon Dooling, who played in the NBA for, for, for quite a while. He went to Missouri originally. Quentin Richardson, um, me, Mike Miller, um, and Nick Collison. And I, and I think the other – who, who else? Was it Steve Blake? Was, Steve Blake was on the team. Didn't, Blake, even yeah. Didn't even start. Um, wow. You know, so, I mean, there was, there was a wide range of guys. And then, like, once you made the team the first year – Almost the whole, everybody made it the second year. They still had the trial. We went to Colorado Springs where the, where the Olympic facility is and, and did like a three-day tryout. And it was, I mean, it was awesome. I, I remember getting on the plane. I get on the plane to fly out there. Mm-hmm. And I see this dude get on the plane. And I was like, oh, I know he was a basketball player. And his back was like, it, I mean, it was so big and wide. And it was Wally Zerbiak. I, but I didn't oh, know who he was. Oh, really? Yeah. And I'm like, man, if I got to go against this dude. But I didn't know there was a tryout for the older team, too. So, like, the older team, it was, like, two years – it was, like, college basketball players. And it was, like, mm-hmm. Wally Zerbiak and um, Kenya Martin. I mean, there was uh, – Sean Marion. I mean, there was all kinds of big-time college players. But I thought I was going against this dude. I was, like, man, I'm in trouble. So, like, they would play right in, in the court right next to us. So, it was awesome. When we were done, we would just sit there and watch those guys play. And uh, you just go, like – it's like if you get there Thursday night, you play all day Friday, play all day Saturday, and then they fly you out. They, they tell you like six in the morning on Sunday who made the team and then they just fly you out mm-hmm. and you're done until till like the summer and then they bring you we went to uh, Arizona State for two weeks because our, our our well the I'm sorry the first year was Jim, Jim Beheim was the coach so we went to Syracuse for like 10 days of practice they took us to a Yankees game I mean they did it right it was unbelievable all the stuff they did for us but we were practicing twice a day and um our practices weren't bad but I mean like you know he Beheim was cool as hell. And then we go to the first game and we're up like 28 at half. And uh, right before half, I think somebody, Quentin Richardson threw a lob to somebody. He didn't catch it and he didn't finish it. So we came into half. We're all, we're all hyped and excited. And he went off on us for like five straight minutes. I mean, cussing everything. Like, what the hell are you guys doing? Don't throw it. You know, like, yeah. finish the layup. We're like, we're looking around like, coach, we're up 30. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I mean, but Beheim was, I mean, Beheim was awesome. He was an you know, unbelievable dude. I want to, yeah, I want to ask you what Beheim was like. I mean, I, I, obviously he was, he was cool. Did you learn, what'd you learn from him? Uh, I mean, it was just, I, I, you know, it was so long ago, but like, and, you know, just being a player, I, I wasn't really paying attention to him as a, yeah. you know, what, but I just remember him, like our practices, we, we, he didn't yell at all really during practice, but mm-hmm. we went hard. And he, like, he was just confident in what he did. I mean, you know, he's been doing it for so long. Mm-hmm. But then when it was, like, when we got – like, I'm telling you in that story, when we got to the game, he just flipped a switch where he was, like, I'm not playing around. You guys better quit playing around. And, you know, we ended up blowing everybody out because that was just North America and South America. But he didn't want to just win by 10 or 5. Mm-hmm. He wanted to win every game by 30-plus. And, I mean, on that staff, uh, you know, like, the next year it was Dave Odom was the assistant coach. I mean, these are all head coaches at big time schools. So that's how I end up transferring to Wake Forest because mm-hmm. that year, uh, going into that year was, was when I played with Dave Odom and then going to my sophomore year. And then my sophomore year is when we didn't, you know, we won like five games at Northwestern. And I was like looking to transfer and then he, you know, that's what, how I had that connection with him. So, um, but I mean, it was looking back on it. I mean, unbelievable opportunity for a guy who was like, I was a good high school player, I was a division one player, but there's a lot of guys that were, way higher, you know, touted than me, much more talented. But for some reason, they allowed me to get the tryout. And I just took it serious enough where I was in better shape than everybody else. I performed well for, like, three days. And then I just kind of, you know, like, took it took it from there. But, I mean, even the practices were awesome. You know, yeah. like, the, the 10 days at Syracuse when it was, like, going against, like, a, you know, eventually eight to ten pros. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. you know, Mike Miller, I was, like, I remember shooting after practice with Mike Miller, uh, you know, just having three-point competitions and uh, – you know, like Mike Miller, so we go, we went to, uh, like, it was, uh, well, I'm trying to think of what country it was. It was in South America. I'll think of it. But beautiful place. Mm-hmm. Last day, we're going, we're staying at a place that has a casino down there. <laughs> um, so like, we won the gold. We're qualified for next year. And we all go down to the casino. Bayheim's down. They're all down there. And um, I lost some money. And uh, I was like, Mike, let me get, you know, like, you know, uh, I, I ran up a bill because, like, I was calling home, calling my parents. and that, you know, Hey, like, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I got to take this. This is from Headball Coach. Was, was it uh, – was that with the Dominican Republic? Dominican Republic. That's what it was. Okay. I, I okay. You know, like, we, we had, like, 
we were all making wow. calls home and doing stuff. And, and like, they came the last day, they were like, by the way, you owe, you know, you owe a hundred dollars for calling home every day. And it was like, so like, we're, we're all out of money, you know? And I was like, Mike, let me borrow some money. I'll pay you back. You know, I'd known him for like 10 days. You know, he's from <laughs> North Dakota or South Dakota or something. Uh -huh. and, and he, he let me like, you know, 50 bucks. I ended up like winning some money, uh, you know, like gambling. And then I did, you know, I paid my phone bill and I was like, man, you know, I, I appreciate it. I was like, I'll pay you back. You know, and, and I did. And it was just like, <laughs> It was just bonds that, you know, when you look back on it, like I didn't even want to go on it because I was missing my graduation. Yeah. And, you know, I just wanted to hang out with my friends. I was leaving for school and my parents made me go on. I was so glad I did, you mm -hmm. know, but, um, but then we got to do it again the next year. So yeah. um, just, just really fortunate because then you go next year, you go to Portugal, you get to see Europe and, and again, you're still competing. And we lost to Spain in the championship game. And I don't remember who, like, Karolinko played for Russia. Um, I don't know, if, I forgot his first name, but he played in the NBA for years. And Spain had to have... Andre, Andre had. Karolinko. Yeah, Andre yeah. Karolinko. And, and Spain had, I don't think, you know, they had they had to have a couple guys that end up eventually right. in the NBA. But right. uh, it was a hell of a game. But unbelievable experience. So fortunate to be able to to do all that, you know. I, yeah, man, that's, that's crazy. I didn't know some of those stories. That's wild. What yeah. was uh what was Northwestern and Wake like? Kind of the, what was some differences between the two? Just being in a high major, what was that like? Well, Northwestern, they're both very small schools. I mean, Northwestern at that time was eight thousand undergrad, and then Wake Forest was four thousand. So I mean, they're both private, aren't they? Aren't they? Aren't they both private? Yeah, yeah. both really small schools. Um, you know, Northwestern was more of a football school, but it's actually more of an academic school. Like they, you know, sports weren't very big. But Northwestern was like the only Big Ten option where I knew I could go. Number one, I that I got offered. Number two, I thought I could play right away. So I mean, it was uh, it was an awesome experience because it was it was a great academic school, but it, it was tough, man. I mean, we were you know, I, but my freshman year we were pretty good. We our our center was was the co Big Ten Player of the Year with Mateen Cleve. So like we we won 15 games. We ended up going to the NIT for uh, which was only the third time in the school's history. Um, but just a different. Um, you know, being up in Chicago and nobody, you know, like we didn't, we didn't get good, great crowds. Um, like I said, it was a football school and they'd just gone to the Rose Bowl a couple of years before. So like people were excited about football, but basketball was just different. But for me, I didn't care. I mean, it was awesome. Like playing in the Big Ten, um, you know, there was nothing like it. But you go from the Big Ten to the ACC, the, the style of basketball is completely different. Uh, it's a lot faster league. It's, it's way more athletic. But when you go to Wake Forest, I mean, it's basketball. I mean, you know, they know they know their basketball so well. Um, they knew everything about all the players. They knew the game. And so it was going from, you know, almost like a football conference to big-time basketball conference. And you get to play at Carolina. Dude, I, I got to sit out the year, you know, because I transferred. Yeah. So as a, as a sit-out, you, you could go on road trips if you paid for them yourself. If you didn't pay, you know, like, otherwise you couldn't go. But, I mean, I, I didn't go to all of them. But it was it was unreal to be able to, like, be on the bench, not have to play, and just kind of take it all in. Mm -hmm. It was just a, such a different perspective. And it just, I mean, but there's nothing like playing at Carolina and Duke, man. It was just, I mean, it, but there's nothing like being on the bench and just watching it too. So um, just to be able to experience both of those conferences, it was like two different worlds. End up having three head coaches throughout the process. Kevin O'Neill at Northwestern. I transferred to Wake Forest to play for Dave Odom the next year, the year after I set out, he leaves because he got a job opportunity at South Carolina. And then Skip Prosser comes in. So three different guys with completely different philosophies, whole different styles. Uh, but, you know, for my coaching career, it was awesome because you see so many different ways to win. There's no one way to do it. There really isn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but just not just the, the X's and O's, but the way they run their program, the way, you know, all the stuff they do off the court. And, and uh, you know, obviously Coach Frost passed away. I don't really keep in touch with Kevin O'Neill. That's, uh, you know, we could do a whole podcast on Kevin O'Neill and all, <laughs> the, all the crazy stuff he did. But Coach Odom still, um, you know, I, I would see I see him every year at the Final Four. I talk to him every once in a while, and I always tell him, you know, I really appreciate you t uh, recruiting me to Wake Forest because that eventually led to, uh, you know, me marrying my wife, who mm -hmm. her brother was, was my roommate. So I always thank him. I always mm -hmm. say, like, the reason why you know I married her thank you but he you know great guys you get to that level I don't care who you are those guys are some they're the best in their profession you mm -hmm. know they're, 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 there's different ways to do it but all those guys are really good coaches uh, they know what they're doing they've been you know now that I'm on the coaching side of it it's like you realize how much success those guys had to have for so many years to get to mm -hmm. that level um, 
you know, it, it's it's so, you're so fortunate to be able to to be around it. What makes them so great? Are they, are they just wired different? What makes them so great? I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't think there's one thing that, you know, I, I think sometimes this is my opinion that when you're younger, cause I always was, uh, and I still am trying to find like, what makes this guy great and how can I get better? And I don't think they're, you know, like a lot of people say like, you got to be obsessed with it or you got to, mm-hmm. you know, do this or, you know, I don't think there's one thing. I, I think everybody, honestly, I think the biggest thing is like, you find out what your, what your groove as a coach is. Cause like, you know, you can't try to be somebody else. Now, I mean, the, the, the fundamental things of like work ethic and, and discipline and being able to relate, being able to recruit, all those things, they have to come there. But, um, you know, I mean, Kevin O'Neill was the best defense coach I had by far. We did, we literally did walk through our, the day of games. I'm not going to call them walkthroughs. We did full on practices for like an hour and 20 minutes where I was on the, I started most of my games there. We guarded the other team's plays for an hour the day of the game and we would have a game at like 12 o'clock and we would be doing it at like seven in the morning going. Oh my goodness. And there was, I literally <laughs> my ankle once during a practice day of the game, couldn't play in the game. So, I mean, we were unbelievable on defense. We were the worst offensive team I've ever been a part of. Right. <laughs> but he was all about discipline and he was about hard work and he was, you know, I mean, like we, if you didn't know the scouting report, I mean, we literally had on our, our placemats, when we had pregame meal, it was a paper placemat with the scouting report on. That is oh my crazy. goodness! And he would and, and and like you never knew when, but like he we'd be eating dinner and he'd be like, "Lapor, what does number twelve do?" And if you didn't know, I mean, it was like we were all. I mean, and I remember one time we were playing Indiana. We're playing Indiana. He's like, uh, and I'm starting, and and uh, he asked me about some dude that's like the ninth guy off the bench. You know, he's like, "What's uh, what's 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 number twelve? You know, whatever fifteen do?" And I was like, "Uh." he's a shooter you know I'm like we're playing Indiana I mean you know he's got to be a shooter <laughs> and he's like you didn't know you know he, he starts going but he starts going nuts and then you go from that to Dave Odom and Dave Odom was just really relaxed uh he was really like you know he, he just seemed to be confident what he, he would just talk about man we're gonna win you know like we just gotta do what we're gonna do we're gonna win he was more relaxed he was more like he let the players kind of do their thing um, it was a half court type of style. We didn't play as much defense, nowhere near, but he let them play offensively. You know, he let the guys that could play, he let them go. And, you know, he had a lot of success. I mean, obviously through the years with Tim Duncan and Randolph mm-hmm. Childress. And, and I mean, um, I mean, he, he went all the way back. He coached uh, Ralph Sampson at Virginia. He'd been doing it for so, so long. But then Skip Prosser comes in and Skip Prosser was just a big time motivator. I mean, he didn't really care that much about X's and O's. We didn't run the greatest offense, but we played hard. He cared about rebounding and he just cared about like, I mean, just, he just motivated the hell out of us. So mm-hmm. it's just like, as a player, I didn't really realize at the time, you got to realize you, you got to go play for a guy that fits what you do well, because, you know, if you're a defensive stopper and you're in a system with a guy that really only cares about offense, you're only going to bring so much value in his mind, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, but to answer your question, I know I didn't really get to your question about what makes him great. Um, I think at that point they all realized like who they were and what they were going to be good at. Mm-hmm. And then they just went and got really good at that mm-hmm. instead of, you know, trying to be somebody else, but you have to be competitive. Um, but I, I think, I think I do will say one thing is you have to, you have to have a willingness to get better no matter what stage you are in your career as a coach or what stage you are in life, because you can always, you can always learn from the next guy but the minute you start thinking, you know, I'm good, I don't need to learn any of this other stuff, then you're really only hurting yourself. So, um, I mean, all those guys were, were really, really good at what they did. Um, so you talked about these head coaches that have this, like, that have made it, right? They're really good if they're at the highest level. Um, you will have also, as a player, you basically talked about being third off your bench, third off the bench in high school, or not third off the bench, excuse me the third best player in high school and working your way up from Northwestern then to Wake Forest, et cetera. And now as a coach, you've been high school coach, uh, prep school at Hargrave, VMI, EKU. So I feel like you're the perfect person to ask. So I do three keys every single week. And uh, I used to do them at the very start of the podcast. Now I just ask the person that comes on because they are smarter than me, or as I say, smarter than I. So you are that person this week. So um, referring to that, what are the three keys to moving up the ladder in the coaching industry? Well, uh, before I answer that question, who's smarter, you or Asa? Oh, gosh. Um, they, and and would... what? And what? 
Uh, well, IQ, if you guys took an IQ test, who would have a higher score? You know, I, 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 That's I don't, a- I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to talk bad about Asa. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so here's the thing about Asa. Here's the thing about Asa. In your opinion. Asa is, your opinion. is a lot more intelligent than people give him credit for. Thanks, Nate. Thanks. I appreciate it. Now, he's that. also very opinionated and might leave some logic out off the table. <laughs> I can, yeah. But, but, um, I, I think he probably has a higher, I think he probably has a high IQ. I'm not going to say he's higher than me. I have confidence in myself, but. Okay. I think what about basketball IQ? I, I, I'm going to win that one. Nate's, yeah, Nate, Nate, Nate's, Nate's a much better X's and O's guys, X's and O's guy than I am. Okay. All but right. Just people it. wise, yeah. he that that that's a that's a guy that knows his way around talking to some people right there. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no <laughs> doubt. I might get I, I and I can talk someone's head off too, but I am gonna give you the you I'm gonna give you the nod on that one, Asa. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> that's interesting. That's good to know. Uh so three what three keys in in the becoming a coach or what were the three uh, keys? moving up the ladder because you've gone from high school to prep school to VMI to EKU, so uh, you know, the, it, it, like I've had a lot of guys ask me that, like, how do you get into coaching? How do you move up? And, and, mm-hmm. and that's another thing where there's no one way to do it. Everybody has their own path. Everybody Absolutely. Has yeah. different. And that's a hundred percent. I mean, you know, does it help to be a former player at, at, you know, two um, high major schools? No question. Cause everybody, you know, like a lot of people know your name or played against you or, or like coaches remember you, mm-hmm. you know, from the recruiting trail or playing against you, that helps for sure. But um, I, I'll go back to what I said earlier. You got to get better. You you have to improve yourself as a coach every single year. And when I first started, I, even like when I was coaching Ace, I, was, I thought I was a good coach. You know, like I got you know I thought I I knew the game and 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 I did. Like you know, I I thought I have a pretty good understanding of the game because I never was played at the levels I played at because I was talented. My talent was my work ethic, and I had to learn how to play the right way to compete at. at the ACC, the Big Ten, and then, you know, playing overseas. So I thought that helped me as a coach um, because when you're, you're coaching, you know, you kind of just stay out of the way that, uh, of the guys that are, that are really, that are really, you know, like know how to, that, that are good. You know I mean? You kind of sure. just let them go. I mean, you can always improve on people, but, um, you know, if, if you're able to improve yourself and that, this is as a coach, as a person, you know, whether you're trying to improve physically, whether you're pro- trying to improve mentally uh, or spiritually, whatever it is. I talked to all my guys about that. I just talked to a player today. I said, you need to improve in three areas and your game will get better mentally, spiritually, physically. You got to be doing something every day, whether it's 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day in all three areas, and you're going to get better. You're, you're, if you're doing that, then your ability to coach, your ability to connect to people, your ability to teach, like all coaching is, is trying to get players to get better right Mm -hmm. yeah well every coach says we're going to get better and we're going to get better and we're going to work and we're going to get better but if you don't know how to get yourself better how are you going to teach a kid how to get better because it's all a process it's all you can't just be like here's the drills do them five times a week and you'll get better yeah the kid will get better but in coaching there was a long time where i'd be like man you know like these kids i'm telling them to do this stuff and they get better but it doesn't really translate to the game like it should so, and, and, and it's never that easy. You can't just like, you know, if it was that easy, it's just, you know, like everybody would just be like, well, shoot for 20 minutes a day and shoot a hundred shots from these spots. And then you'll be a, you'll be a great shooter. But there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of the mental game that goes into it. So like now when I teach kids to shoot and that's the thing I enjoy the most, but I teach kids, you know, like, well, you got to get your reps up and you gotta work on your form, but I do way more just, we compete. Like we're doing yes. competition shooting and because they have to have that feeling during when they practice, like they have in the game. Cause when you're in the game, that feeling is like, man, yeah, they got to have some pressure on the ball. Yeah. I mean, like if that shot doesn't go in, you're, you're, you're not happy as a player. Cause mm-hmm. you know, you don't get a lot of shots and you want every shot to go in when you practice and you don't care if you miss the shot, you're basically wasting your time sure. from the, from the emotional standpoint of like what it's like to be a shooter. And Asa knows, you know, what it's like to be a shooter, especially when you're a three point shooter. And Nate, sh- Nate, Nate knows much more about how to be a shooter than I do coach. He was much oh, really? better shooter than I was in school. Much, much I never much said better. you were a good shooter. I just I said, know. You know, <laughs> yes, you were. Yeah. Asa. I got you. I got you. Ace. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, but you know, like you think about the three point shot, mm-hmm. um, it's the hardest shot in the game, obviously. There's a reason why you get three points for it. And, but 
like when you miss one, a lot of coaches are like, oh man, here we go. Like how many, I, the game has changed a lot where like a lot of the guys get to shoot more threes now, but I mean, how many on your team, Asa, how many, how many guys on your team did you guys run plays to get him a three point shot? Probably one or two. Yeah. About, yeah, two. You know, uh, you know, like two guys. So, but everybody on the team wants to shoot threes. Yeah. Yeah. And sure. like when I was playing, it was like, we, if somebody wrote ran a play for you to shoot a three, you, you, you had to be like the, the best three point shooter in the country. So mm -hmm. It's so hard to have that confidence emotionally after you miss one with, with the pressure on you to, like, keep coming back and back and thinking you're going to make that shot. And, like, so how do you when, – when you drill the kid, how do you get him to practice that? you gotta make him, you got to make him compete to where the point where if he misses it, he feels it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and that's hard to do because, you know, when you're, you're, you're playing against your teammates, every, or you're in the drills every day as a coach, you're trying to make them competitive and, like, maybe you make the losers run or, like, you keep a board that, that everybody can see who wins every day. But as, like, you go through the, the months and, like, the same guy wins every time, everybody's kind of like, ah, you know, I don't care if I lose. But, you know, you, you got to try to add that into your drills to make it translate. So you, there, there's, you know, like, getting a guy better is, is, is a hard thing to get good at. But once you, you start learning different things, then you can, you know, th then you get better at it. But that's the first key is just, like, you got you to get better yourself so you can get guys better. Um, I mean, I think the second thing is, is the ability to like you're talking about what Ace is really good at is like to be able to, to, to communicate with people and relate to people mm -hmm. um, because it's just whether you like it or not as a, as a basketball coach it's a huge part of the business it just is Absolutely. it's a huge part of most businesses but some some businesses if you're an expert at something you don't have to talk to people right you don't have to sell mm -hmm. to people you don't have to relate to people but this is basketball it's a team game you got to bring in players you got to get to know people um, so it, it's it's you know, you got to be able to, and and you got to be re be able to relate to many different ethnicities, maybe many different backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. Kids that come from a lot of money, kids that come from no money, kids that come from the country, kids that come from the city. You know, it does, like all these kids can play really good basketball. So your ability to do that's going to help you in, in so many ways, and then that's going to help you build your team and get them to play. You know, once you get them all here, then you got to get them to play together. Mm -hmm. You know. So that's a huge part of it. And then, um, you know, I, I think a third thing is just you got to be patient. Um, this mm -hmm. business, it, honestly, it, it's tough, and especially in the beginning. I mean, it is tough. And, and like, you know, you're not going to make a lot of money. You're going to want to advance really quickly. It just the majority of the time, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, you know, you've heard my story, but I mean, I, I played at two high majors. And I didn't get right into coaching, so maybe if I got in younger, I'd be able to be, be able to climb the ladder quicker. But I mean, I, I was working uh, for Spalding, which was still kind of keeping me involved in basketball, and, and I worked at my at my high school for like five years, um, part you know like part time. And I really wasn't trying to get into coaching there, but I mean, that's five years of like that helped on my resume. Then I went to a prep school, and made ten grand a year, you mm -hmm. know. And I was I was I had a full time job. I was making money. I was like. And I, I was living in Los Angeles, California, and I moved to Chatham, Virginia. <laughs> you know, and, a bit of a change of scenery right there. Yeah. I mean, you know, just to, just to try to get a chance to uh, have a chance to get a job. And then luckily, the guy that hired me at BMI played against me. Uh, he played at Penn State when I played at Northwestern. So that helped. But then the, there was a guy on his staff that has – had been in coaching. He's now been in coaching for 40 years that coached AW and I at Wake Forest and then worked with the guy that hired me for like five years. So he trusted his, you know, his recommendation. So, I mean, all that had to come together just for me to get an interview, mm -hmm. you know, and then from there you, you got to take it. But um, I mean, you got to be patient, you know, I mean, um, it, it it's one of those jobs where I think, people talk about like dreaming and visualizing things and everybody's always like sees themselves like going here. Uh, you know, I think it's hard to like, people are like, what, you know, like what level do you want to go to? And, you know, like I have my dreams, I have my goals, but I'm more, I'm the older I get, I'm more about like, just get, I'm going to get, try to get better every day and I'm going to try to work on myself. And then, you know, whatever happens, happens. Cause I think sometimes guys get discouraged and they get disappointed because they yeah. have it in their head. I'm going to be at this level at this age. And if I don't get there, I'm a failure, but really you don't, you can't control a lot of it. That's the frustrating thing. You can't control the opportunities that you get. 
Um, but you can't control how much better you get every day. You can't control how many people you're net, you know, you, you got to control what you can control. And then the less, mm-hmm. the rest, you got to let it go. Mm-hmm. So, but once you get into the business, another thing you can't control is recruiting. Another thing you can't control is how well yeah. your players. I mean, like Ace and I talked about it this year. He was like, man, I, you know, he said something like, man, I just wish I, you know, like I could control when I was a player. I, you know, I knew what I could do, but now you're just trying to get these guys to feel the yeah. same way you feel. And, you know, when you're younger, you think you can get every player to do, you know, like, I'm going to get them to play as hard as I did. Or <laughs> you sure. think that you're, like, the greatest gift. Like, well, if they're going to listen to anybody, it's going to yeah, be me. like, all you got to do is. Like, why would they do, not listen to me? Yeah, yeah, I got to do is say, hey, man, come here. It, you know, you should really care about this. And, right. and they're like, oh, man, I never thought about this before. And <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden, they're going to do everything the right way. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean. You know, the longer you get in it, it's it's sure. so it's like I've gone through stages where I'm like in the beginning, I'm like, I'm telling all of them how to I'm gonna teach them all how to shoot better. And then and then after like a couple of years, I was like, Man, I'm not talking to anybody unless they ask me if they want the buttons because <laughs> they they're not listening to a word I'm telling them anyway. And then as I keep going, I'm like, Well, maybe I should just like I'll throw them a little bit of hints and then hopefully they'll come later. And then I'll you know, like like you every year you're still kind of feeling out like did I did I be aggressive am I aggressive with this kid yeah it ebbs and flows for sure you know I mean (laughs) and every kid's different so it's tough because I mean the longer you're in it the more frustrating it gets that like man I could get this kid so much better if he would just listen to me (laughs) me, you know but you know you got to earn the trust I think it's important to understand that these guys aren't you you know they're they're not they are not you as a as a player at all and I think the quicker you understand that kind of the quicker you know that adjustment will will be um all right hey coach real quick we're gonna wrap up with some uh with some rapid fire questions you cool with that yeah yeah all right uh hey you ever been kicked you ever been kicked out of a game no no never okay um ever uh excuse me foul up three on uh, foul up three or let it play out at the uh, end of the game. I'll let it play out. Let it play yeah. out. Okay. Uh, leave your best player in with two fouls in the first half. Depends on who it is, but uh, probably not. Okay. Uh, go for the tie or go for the win? Let's go for the win. Uh, suits or sweats on the sidelines? Oh, sweats, man. <laughs> <laughs> Early morning practice or evening or night practice? I would go uh, night practice. Night practice. Okay. I think that's our first one, Nate. That is. This um, is the first night. If you – well, you've, you've had a job. Are, that, why do you practice in the morning when all your games are at 7.30? I kind of – I, I see that side. I, I'm, I'm with that side. Um, you, well, okay, if you couldn't be in this world of sports, what would you do? Or co- if you couldn't coach basketball, what would you do? Uh, something in golf. Uh, <laughs> it's, all right, okay. What's your handicap? Uh, seven. Is it really? Yeah, you want, I'll take a picture of it if you want. If you don't believe me, man. <laughs> <laughs> this guy I'm talking about is it really? Oh, okay, all right, all right. I got some work. I mean, so what you give me? You gonna give me about six strokes on the uh, on the course? Well, the giving strokes thing. I mean, I, that's know, how it's that how it works. That's how it works. It's not in real life though. Does Tiger Woods give strokes to anybody when he goes into the, to the Masters? No, but all those guys are. I mean, no, no. no you're yeah, but all right, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Well, I'm coming for you when you and I play. Whenever All right, that I'm ready. Soon. Uh, should every team make the commerce tourney? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah why, I mean, it's 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 March Madness. Why not? Why well, not? easy easy for you to say this year. I mean, easy. Well, for you I mean, to say. no, I mean, like so. The first year we lost. We lost uh, the last second. We lose the game to Moorhead, and we have a four way tie for eighth. And we, we were two of the four teams that didn't make it. I remember that because yeah, yeah, that's that, yeah. crazy. I remember no, that. I mean, it, that but I mean, like, especially in these. All right, so if you're if you're an OVC, one team pretty much every year, one team's going to make it to the NCAA tournament. Why would you not put them, give them all the chance? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, what are the chances of the twelve the twelve seed beating the one? <clears throat> yeah, not very, not very high. Yeah. Um. Last question. I may have to edit this out. Who'd you date in college? <laughs> uh, you know, I dated. Um, I I dated Meghan Markle. Um, but it was at Northwestern and, uh, it was, uh, you know, she, she's a good girl. She's a, she's a great person, but, uh, looking back on it, I think, I think she just dated me just cause I was a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> At least she really liked me. So That's funny. All right. Uh, Hey, that, that's all we got. Oh, well, LeBron or Jordan. Are you a LeBron guy? I mean, I'm from Cleveland, but I, I can't I can't say LeBron's better than Jordan. Yeah. I mean, I, but the problem with that is I grew up in the Jordan era, you know. So like, whatever era you grow up in, 
there you're gonna go with that. I think one. that's the greatest player, but I I still would take Jordan over LeBron. Yeah, that's crazy. So my wife actually went to Copley, um, if you know where oh, Copley, okay. yeah, yeah, in Akron. So big LeBron people, <laughs> big LeBron people. Oh, you got to be when you're when you're from there, and he won mm-hmm. us a championship and all that stuff. But I mean, it's hard to. Jordan was just. Uh, I mean, LeBron. I mean, it, it's it's hard. I, I you know, like LeBron's done things that you know nobody else has done but it, it like Jordan was just more competitive and would take games over and um I don't know I, I don't think you, you can argue all day with this stuff you know? yeah. um all right coach man I appreciate you coming on tonight uh where can everybody find you on Instagram or Twitter um my Twitter I don't yeah I'm not like you guys I don't have the stuff memorized but uh <laughs> Hold on, I'll tell you. I think it's either at like Steve Lapore or Lapore Steve. Yeah, I think you're just like Steve Lapore or something. I'll tell you this, my my name on Twitter, it's at Lapore Steve with the, the like, what do you call the name that you can like write in, whatever that is. Mine's called, it's called the Shot Practitioner because one of our uh, players named me that. One of the players that actually listened to what I tell him was like, uh, he said one day, he's like, you're like a shot doctor. I was like, no, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a shot doctor. That name's already taken. He's like, you gotta come up with some other name. And then I was like, well, what do you, you know, why don't you come up with something? He told me, he's like, more like a general practitioner. I was like, there it is, a shot practitioner. So I, <laughs> that I like that. I like that. Well, well, nice. well uh, you can find myself at the Ace of Spades on Instagram. You can find Nathan at Nate5 underscore Moran on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find Mind of a Coach uh, at, mind, at Mind of a Coach on Instagram and at Mind of a Coach one on Twitter. Coach before. Appreciate you coming on again, man. Uh, best of luck to y'all in the A Sun. Do y'all have a? Uh, are y'all are y'all making a postseason tournament? Are they doing the CIT this year? I don't even know. No, they're not doing the CIT, but there's. Um, uh, I think they're doing the. I forgot the name of the other one. CBI. It, we, yeah, they might be doing CBI, the but we don't. It doesn't look like it, but we're still kind of holding up, hoping it's the case too. But uh, we'll see. Cool, man. Cool. Well, I appreciate you again, and thank y'all for tuning in.